we're going to be talking about biohacking, biotech, and biomarkers as they relate to longevity. And the reason this is important, I think, how many people in here consider themselves a biohacker? I have the whole room, right? Um, stay over here. Oh, I see my corral. I don't do well with corral, so you're going to be pulling me back the whole time. Um, so the challenge is when we start talking about biohacking, things like that, we get it, okay? We've talked about it. We know it's important. But a lot of times we have to have a story to bring others along with us. And I hope by the end of this you have this story that you need to bring others along. Now, when we start looking at biohacking, I think it's important to look at other animals and animal models. And what we see, if we take a look at an orca in captivity or an orca in a wild, what do you see is the big difference between those two? Anybody? Well, phenotypically, what do you see a difference as? Oh, the, the dorsal fin. See, look at the dorsal fin on uh, an orca in the wild. So there's not enough environmental force on that orca's dorsal fin for it to express its DNA when you put it in an aquarium. And when we take a look at other animal models, if we look at zoo animals, zoo animals many times, when, when they were in the old zoo cells, the average length of life of this animal was about three and a half years. They were neurotic. They had digestive problems, much like your neighbor. Um, but the question I have for you is, which side of the aquarium do you live on? And this is an important part as we take a look at this. One of our challenges is we have, we evolved, our DNA evolved to adapt. That's what gave Homo sapiens the ability to, to progress past Neanderthals and, and, and begin to populate their DNA. Because we could adapt, we could adapt to temperature, we could adapt to foods, we could adapt to a lot of challenges that come. So... But what we've seen is that as we've evolved, we found a need to biohack. Now, when I went back and looked, I looked at some of the first biohacking that took place. So in 1492, what happened? This is sixth grade social studies. <laughs> Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right. So do you, anybody know how long Columbus was, uh, from the time they left Portugal to where they got to the Bahamas, you know how long that was? Three months. It was only about 36 days, so it was pretty quick. But, so that's 1492. By the mid-1700s, which was the age of piracy, we had people living on boats for, for years at a time, okay? And what we found is that a pirate or someone who was on a boat for an extended period of time, the food sources that you could travel with led to a condition called scurvy. So it's a vitamin C deficiency. And literally some of the first biohackings when they use citrus fruit that they would travel with to give vitamin C to prevent scurvy. So this is where the term limeys, as, they apply, as applied to the Brits that were sailing at a time, or those scurvy sailors, that's where those terms came from. So literally, this is where we start to look at biohacking, because we modified our aquariums, we modified our environments. So the challenge is when we start looking at longevity, you know, a lot of times, uh, in longevity, they want to live to 120 years old or 180 years old. Well, one of our challenges is how do we get past... 60 to 80. This is one of the challenges we have. And what we see here is a graph of how we die. Okay? So if, you, if, if we're looking at a situation where someone is very young um, down here, so we, what we see in this is that we have a lot of genetic disorders cause death when you're young. As you move into middle age, you see that purple area that expands in middle age? This is what your mother warned you about. Don't text and drive. Slow down. Wear your seatbelt. Don't be stupid. Um, this is, this is kind of how we get through middle age. But as we move towards later in our lives, what I call our third third, we spend the first third of our lives learning. We spend the second third of our lives in service to others, work, family, things like that. My wife and I, um, our daughter moved out January 2nd of, last, of this year. Um, she moved. She's coaching up in Chicago. We live in Ohio. She's now, she's, got her, she, she's now out of school. She's got a real job. Our daughter's not moving back. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. So we're moving into the third third of our life. It's our, it's our time. Okay, and it's, we're doing what we choose to do. But that third, third, what's going to take you out? What do you have to watch out for? Well, when you look at the light blues in this, that dark blue, we're looking at cancer. We're looking at cardiovascular disease. We're looking at inflammation-based diseases. Okay, and this is an important part as we take a look at this. 
listen, we can't get to 150 unless we can get through 70. Okay, we got to get through 70 first. Um, and this is the challenge. So when we take a look at inflammation, neurodegeneration, cancer, um, uh, decreased immunity, there is a single element that connects all of these. And it's a term that we refer to as what's called autophagy. Does anybody, does everybody recognize this term? If you've heard of autophagy, do me a favor, put your hand up. So some, okay, very good. Ato Listen, it's a relatively new term. Since you're biohackers, you understand this. It, we, they just gave a Nobel Prize in 2016 to the Japanese researcher that, that basically explained the process of autophagy. This is cutting edge kind of stuff. But as autophagy improves, we see a drop in inflammation. We see a drop in neurodegeneration. We see a drop, we see an improvement in infectious response. Um, we see a drop in cancers. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So when we look at the autophagy mechanism, it's important. And autophagy is typically triggered with stress of some kind. Now, it's not triggered with the stress of the IRS threatening an audit, or it's not triggered with the stress of your mate, you know, threatening to move out or causing problems. That's not the kind of stress we're talking about. We're talking about evolutionary stresses. The IRS was not, has not been here as we've evolved. It's a relatively new thing. Um, but when we look at a drop in oxygen levels to the muscle, so what, what we call... Um, uh, uh, when we see a drop from exercise, we'll see a trigger in the autophagy mechanisms. If we fast, if we limit nutrient content, we'll see autophagy triggers. As we see heat use, and I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that last talk, looking at nitric oxide and this autophagy process, very much hand-in-hand -hand processes, and we've got to spend some time talking about that. Heat um, triggers autophagy. This is the value of sauna. We'll talk more about that as we go. But what a researcher in Austria found is that there is a key molecule in the upregulation of this autophagy process. And that's what we call this molecule called spermidine. Spermidine is, we've known about this molecule for a long time. It was first the guy that discovered the microscope, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, must have been a freak because somehow he wound up with some semen underneath his microscope. And I'm thinking, okay, this, this guy definitely is a freak. Um, but he described a crystalline structure in his semen. This was 1790. Um, it wasn't named for another 200 years. A group of Dutch researchers named it spermidine when they were able to isolate the molecule. It's what's called a polyamine. So we'll talk more about this in just a bit. But we've known it's been there for a long time. We've just not known what it does. In the 80s, they were looking at spermidine as it relates to cancer research. They didn't see a, rela a causal relationship there. There's some correlational things that go on. But th we've known about this molecule right now, but a researcher in Austria, Dr. Frank Medeo, identified, ah, oh, spermidine is very critical in this autophagy pathway, primarily with work in senescent cells. Um, back to the COVID, what we see with COVID, COVID interferes with the autophagy mechanism. So COVID overstimulates the beginning of the autophagy process down there at the bottom in the creation of what's called autophagomes, and it interferes with the lysosome bonding with the autophagome that causes a problem there. So this is what, so we start to see a, um, COVID playing a, a critical role in that space. But if you have upregulated autophagy from other areas rather than just natural, then you'll start to see that upregulated autophagy digesting those overproduced um, autophagomes and finishing out the lysosome uh, digestion of that. And again, when we look at comorbidities, comorbidities, morbidity, mor morbidity is the onset of disease late. So whether it's diabetes or any of the inflammations or things like that, these are morbidities that are typically associated with inflammation and low autophagy. Um, so this is where this starts to come into play. Now, how many people in here fast? So why do you fast? I asked this question earlier, and someone said religious, religious practices. I'm like, great. A lot of these long-term religious practices are based on health processes, and this is how it was communicated. So when we see caloric restriction, we see an upregulation of autophagy. Um, we see, and we see, but we see autophagy. We know of at least 67 different proteins in the cell that are related to autophagy. Um, whether they're triggers or not, we're still working that out. We've probably heard about resveratrol. Uh, the, the, the phytonutrient in wine. 
The challenge is um, if there's a benefit, it comes in the first few sips, rarely found at the bottom of the glass. So, and the alcohol that comes with it is not necessarily a benefit. Um, you've probably heard of rapamycin. Um, rapamycin blocks a protein in the cell that creates cellular anabolism. Well, there's a paper just came out last week. Rapamycin has two particular proteins. There's what's called mTOR1, mTOR2, Richter and Raptor. Well, when we look at skin healing, there is a co-engagement of autophagy with Richter uh, supplements. So we actually see a co-engagement of mTOR with autophagy. So this is a really interesting area. Metformin. Um, when we see metformin consumption, which upregulates what's called AMPK production, which also goes with exercise, um, people who take metformin were less likely to have negative symptoms with COVID than people who did not take metformin. So metformin upregulates autophagy well. So these are all mechanisms, but finally we see spermidine as a key molecule in this process. When we look at blue zones around the world, Sardinia, Loma Linda, um, in Greece, what we see is high spermidine diets. We see food that's raised naturally on, on, on very nutrient-dense ground, so we have a high spermidine content. We extract our spermidine from wheat that's grown in Central Europe. We have not been able to find wheat in this country that we can run spermidine extraction processes at. The mechanical production of wheat in this country has basically lowered that particular nutrient. So when people talk about, oh, I'll just take wheat germ to get the benefit, you got to pay attention to where the wheat germ's coming from. So we, right now, we have to extract all of our spermidine from wheat coming from Austria, Ger southern Germany, northern Italy, and this is where this starts to come. But it is important. So this is a spermidine molecule. It's what's called a polyamine. So each one of those blue balls is a nitrogen. The black balls are carbon. The, the, the whites are hydrogens. It's a polyamine. You've probably heard of an amino acid. An amino acid is nitrogen, carbon with an acid molecule. You deaminate that or decarboxylate that, and that becomes a polyamine. Um, by the way, um, spermidine, also an arginine-derived uh, uh, molecule. Um, and this is what a spermidine molecule looks like. We see uh, spermidine coming into our diet orally with, we, anybody here, is anybody a natto eater in here? Um, you, you, you're, I'm telling you, if you, natto is a, uh, a, a soy, um, a fermented soy product. I can't choke it down. Um, it is, but if you grow up eating it, some people get it, God bless you. Um, but um, so we can get it from natto. There are some products, but what we find is that not all wheat germ has spermidine, not all soy has spermidine. Where it's grown, again, back to the nitric oxide and where diets come from, this is the, 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 the alignment on that is really interesting. It's, it is generated de novo in the cells on demand sometimes, but it also comes from the intestinal microbiota. Um, so those are the three sources for spermidine. When we see spermidine supplementation, we see tumor suppression take place. Okay, so we drop. It's interfering with the mechanisms and the, 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 the roles of, this, of, of tumor production and genesis, and it helps break down that tumor and create and, and move a cell from necessarily cancerous to senescent to uh, apeptotic. Um, so we see tumor suppression. We see an upregulation in immune response. Um, so autophagy is cleaning out that internal cellular dirt that builds with time. You know, when your cell is, is anabolic, uh, the, the ribosomes are going to the nucleus saying, hey, I'm going to build this protein. As it starts to attach those amino acids, they're not all the same. They're not all done correctly. Sometimes it folds incorrectly. That protein that is produced doesn't go into production. It just sits there and gums up the cell. So unless we have a regular autophagy process to clean out these old proteins, they build up. If you start thinking about uh, the work or the problems with a lot of memory problems or neural diseases, it's the buildup of plaques in the cells. This is resolved with improved autophagy. Um, so we, we see cardio protection at the, in, in the epithelial level of the heart. Again, this improved uh, autophagy working through nitric oxide pathways many times, but we also see an improved uh, mitophagy, so we see an autophagy of the mitochondria, cleaning out the old mitochondria so the new ones can regenerate. Um, a very important process, so we see a cardio protection that takes place, and we see this neuroprotection taking place in the cells. So 
we're seeing the cleanup of these neural cells so they're able to function properly longer. Uh, we, have a, we had a pr paper came out, it's almost a year ago now, we did it to shot today in Berlin, patients that were giving um, high dose spermidine levels, this is a six milligram a day spermidine, um, saw increase in hippocampal size, so the, the part of your brain, the hippocampus, which is important for short term memory, it got bigger. Okay, so we see improved hippocampal performance. We saw a stop of the dimension of the development of dementia. So gave it to patients, uh, all had dementia. Some got spermidine, some didn't. The ones that got spermidine stopped the dementia. The ones that didn't continued to decline. Um, so um, a lot, this, this autophagy driven process is very important. We also see an improvement in what's called epithelial stem cell production. So your skin cells are your epithelial cells. We've been talking about the lining of your gut or epithelial cells. Well, the stem cell production there increases. When we talk to our customers who start using spermidine in three to five weeks, most of them talk about the fact that their nails start growing like crazy, their hair gets better. This is epithelial upregulation of epithelial stem cells. Um, beauty is more than skin deep. If you want beautiful skin, you've got to have healthy skin, and this is where a lot of this starts. So this, and this, by the way, this all comes from a paper called um, Spermidine and Health and Disease. It's in Cell, it's a review paper in Cell. If you have information, be happy to send it to you. Um, but when we start to look at spermidine, oop, I got a format problem I got to fix. Um, spermidine upregulates autophagy, which is increasing myocyte seminus, cardiomyocyte function, elasticity, arterial elasticity, mitochondrial function, respiration. I think I have a slide here in a little bit, but we don't die when we run out of time. We die when we run out of energy. Okay, energy is critical. Energy is a mitochondrial mitigated process. When you're thinking about longevity, you have to think mitochondria, okay? And when we start taking a look, and again, mitochondria has its own DNA. It, 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 doesn't, it has the DNA that came from your mother. Your nuclear DNA comes from your mother and father, but your mitochondria only comes from your mother. It runs its own system. Okay, you've got to clean out that old mitochondria so that the new ones can reproduce and grow and be healthy. And this is so important. We see an arginine and nitric oxide metabolism increase, which means a lower, it blocks high blood pressure. It improves cardiomyocyte stiffness. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the benefit that goes with that. I put this slide in here because there was a, the British Cycling Federation back prior to the London Olympics hired a coach and, and, at this time, Britain had only won like two or three Olympic medals. Um, and he put in a process that was called the, the aggregation of marginal gains. And instead of looking for a silver bullet, they took a look at, at hundreds and hundreds of little changes that would eventually lead to a large improvement, okay? This is where we need to think about as biohackers. And if we engage in a biohacking process where we're looking at upregulating improved processes, this will, this will have a benefit. But remember, we live in aquariums, okay? If we don't mindfully and intentionally engage in biohacking processes, we will eventually start to decline. The pressure of the aquarium is going to cause your dorsal fin to bend. And take, that, and take that as far as you like, but there's going to be a point in time that, you're, that your sugar is going to be so high, you're going to have to deal with type 2 diabetes. You're going to deal with inflammation of some kind. Your blood lipids are going to go up, and they're going to put you on a statin, okay? You can avoid all of that. You can reverse most of that with the engagement of processes that boost longevity, okay? This is where biohacking comes into play. So it's your choice. Okay, this is not something that you have to depend on, but it is a choice and it is intentional and you have to do it or else the aquarium is going to drag you down. The spot where the red light starts, where the red line starts to turn, that is morbidity. Okay, this is where disease gets to the point where it's distracting from the quality of life. So I think this is a point I really wanted to get out here. So what are the practices, what are the tools, what are the things we need to do in order to engage in improvement rather than decline? Well, how do we aggregate improvement rather than decline? Well, I like to talk about what I call the rocks in the jar. Is any, uh, uh, Stephen Covey, has everybody read Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? In that book, if you haven't read it, I really recommend it. I mean, it's an oldie but goodie, but it's, it, there's a lot of truth. 
in that book, they talk about getting the rocks in the jar. And they have a speaker at the time, and I, I haven't done this yet, but puts a big old gallon jar on the stage and then takes a bunch of rocks, big rocks, and puts down and fills it up to the edge and asks the crowd, so what do you think about the jar? And the cr crowd says, well, it's full. Well, then they take and put gravel in around the rocks, okay? And they fill that gravel in there. Then they put sand in the gravel, and then they put water. So at some point in time, you get all the pieces in. But the challenge is this. If I put the gravel and the sand in the jar first, I don't get the big rocks in. So I want to talk about the big rocks of longevity and how that applies. It starts with movement, okay? The hack for movement is exercise. We live in aquariums. We do not have a choice. Listen, if you're Amish, you don't have to exercise, okay? I don't think I have any Amish here today, um, so the rest of us are stuck with the fact we live in an aquarium that we have to adjust. The hack for movement is exercise. You have to drive movement in. You cannot exercise for 30 minutes or an hour and overtake the, pro the, the problems that come on with sitting on your ass at work for eight hours a day, okay? It takes more than that. It takes more movement. You cannot look at it. It may affect weight loss. We have to separate weight loss from health. It's a, it's a bad metric, but we'll talk about it. Movement is critical. I consider it the first big rock in the jar. Um, when we look at the benefits of exercise, most people exercise to lose weight, okay? Worst reason in the world to exercise. Anybody know what this first molecule is? Any geeks in here? We call it brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. BDNF is a molecule that starts learning. It prepares nerves to connect to other nerves, and it's where learning begins. BDMF is a benefit of exercise. Kids in physical education programs that exercise are smarter than kids in school that don't exercise. Movement is critical because of the production of BDNF. By the way, we catalyze the learning experience with dopamine. Okay, so if someone's trying to learn, we get some movement, we learn the process, and then we lock it in with dopamine, we make them feel good about learning, it locks it in. Um, Coaching from a negative standpoint does not produce dopamine, okay? Being able to pay attention to what goes on there is critical. Anybody recognize the second molecule? This is called anandamide. Anandamide is what's called an endocannabinoid. It's a molecule that is produced with exercise, endocannabinoid. If your body is dehydrated, what signal does it give you that it needs hydration? Thirst. It says thirsty, we get water. If your body needs nutrients, what signal does it give you to bring nutrients on board? Hunger. hunger. Yeah, thirst, hunger. What is anxiety? Anxiety is a signal to move, okay? When we move, we produce anandamide. When we produce anandamide, we improve the neural connections. We lower anxiety. By the way, when we start looking at the role of cannabis, we named an endocannabinoid after the cannabis plant because the molecules are the same. We produce anandamide with movement, okay? These are the benefits of exercise. We can hack exercise. Most people think exercise and they think, you know, P90X or CrossFit or something and there's someone, you know, there's someone, there's piles of sweat and someone thrown up in the corner and things like that. We don't need to do that. We need to go back to evolutionary-based movement, okay? Hunter-gatherer, hunter-gatherer, gatherer. It's movement. I think the single most important piece of technology you can add as a biohacker is a heart rate monitor, okay? Because here's the challenge. When we look at heart rate, the bottom of the blue zone is rest. The top of the red zone is I hack a lung up. I can't go any harder, okay? That's, that's the range. We break that into five zones. Typically, when I'm exercising, I don't feel it until I'm in zone four. And I'm feeling the production of lactic acid, okay? Lactic acid is not what you're looking for, okay? It's causing a cortisol, a stress response. If I train in zone two and zone three, I get myogenesis. I'm telling my cells to produce more mitochondria, okay? This is what I get. Zone two is a great place to train for longevity, so in my past life, I was a sports scientist. I'm trained as an exercise physiologist. 
Prior to moving into where I'm at now, I worked as a sports scientist at the Ohio State University working with their wrestling program. We moved the needle with a wrestling team doing cardiovascular training in zone three, okay? You can't feel zone three, okay? You feel zone four, I don't want my athletes there. I don't need that added stress. I get all the benefit in zone two, and as you get older, zone two is fine. If you wanna compete, do some zone three. You get some enzymatic benefit there, it's a good place. But you can't see this and feel this unless you're monitoring. This is, this is the technology that we use to combat the aquarium. Okay, giving ourselves that feedback, it's important. Uh, this is back to the zones. Heat is a hack, okay? People who sauna and exercise have better cardiovascular fitness than people who just exercise. There's some studies that show heat may produce the same cardiovascular benefit as exercise. I'm not, ready to, I'm not ready to endorse that one, but I'm saying it's an interesting relationship. Heat is critical, okay? Sauna, when you take a look at cultures, you know, all religious, all religious practices have fasting of some kind, okay? Um, when you look at most cultures, there's a heat element that goes with it. Particularly when you look at the Nordic cultures, it's still there, Native American cultures, sweat lodges, things like that. So heat has been a big part of the health, maintenance, and development of a lot of cultures. Sauna is important. If you're looking at strength, there is a technology that I really recommend that's called blood flow restriction. You'll notice that she has compression bands on her legs and her arms, she's doing exercise. What this is doing, this is causing an increase in signaling, nitric oxide signaling primarily, at a lower workload. So someone who trains blood flow restricted uses half of the load that someone needs to get the signal that you need to improve. So training at half the load is a benefit. When you look at this athletically, you can train full on one day, come back the next day, do it blood flow restricted, get to double the signal without, without the negative response, without the cortisol, without the torn tissue. Huge hack, huge benefit. If you're not blood flow restricting now, you're wasting energy. Okay, so that's movement. Let's move on. Food. Food is a big rock. Food is very controversial, tends to be more religious than it is science-y for the most part. Um, you know, the DNA that we all walk around with was basically established, depending on the anthropology, let's do 100,000 to a million years ago, okay? But certainly, it's been diversifying ever since then. Without um, extinction, we don't have evolution. We only have diversity. So it's realistic to think that people in this room, one person maybe do better on a vegan diet and someone do better on a carnivore diet just because of the genetic diversity that evolves. You gotta figure out what works for you. Your vegan may not work for the carnivore, your carnivore may not work for the vegan, and when you look at it, it's a bell curve, so there's probably a lot of wiggle room in the middle. The thing that we all can benefit from is less processed food, okay? Eat real food, jerf. Just eat real food. Um, this, is the pro this is the challenge. But we live in an aquarium, okay? It's easy to go through a drive through We tend to be stressed. We, okay, we don't feed until it's too late. Um, figuring out, planning, recognizing you're in an aquarium, make sure you have access, but then bringing on nutrients that the agricultural system is not providing. Okay, this is where things like spermidine and nitric oxide boosters, and these things start to come into play. Supplementation winds up being important. Um, our aquariums are full of sugar, okay? This is our biggest challenge, okay? You walk into a CVS to get your diabetic drugs and you walk through four, you walk through four aisles of sugar, okay? And you know what? It's hard, okay? When you're stressed and you're tired and you're cognitively run out, Sugar feels good, okay? There's nothing more important than getting the refined sugars and the refined flours and the refined carbohydrates out of the diet. It is hard, okay? It is hard. There is a ton of pressure to eat poorly, okay? They don't make this stuff because it tastes bad, okay? It tastes good when it hits your tongue. You know, listen, I'm a huge coffee uh, advocate. I love coffee. Um, I drink my coffee with heavy cream. But uh, man, when I go into Starbucks now, you look about 90% of that menu it is completely sugar driven. Okay. This is one of the challenges that we run into. Sugar in the aquarium has to be resolved. When people start talking about 
improving health. The recommendation is eat less, okay? Lower the kilocalorie intake, lower the calorie intake. So typically we think about this as lowering the number of calories a day. Someone try, tries to go from eating 2,500 calories a day to 1,200 calories a day. It's hard, it doesn't work, it's failed, okay? We've done this long enough, it's a failure, okay? But what we can do is that we can tighten up when we're eating the calories. The work done by Walter Longo at USC with the fasting mimicking diet, if we, you can eat crappy calories in a shorter period of time, as long as you have long periods of time without eating, okay, and there's a health benefit. If you put good calories in that limited feeding window, it's a huge benefit, okay? So when someone decides that they want to improve their health and you say eat less, help them understand eat less time, not less calories. It's not the calories, it's the time. And this is where autophagy comes into play. Autophagy is really hard to measure. This is one of the things we're working on, trying to find a, a, a good measure. When we're measuring ketones in the blood, when you're digesting fats, it produces ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and um, acetone. These can be measured in different ways. This is a breath analyzer. As your ketone level production goes up, your autophagy levels are going up, and this is a feedback mechanism that people can use to feel good about what they're doing. As you get ketone levels up and you're getting feeding in a period of time, this is a great piece of technology. I love this biotech, it's very good. So when we look at food, I saw Molly here a little bit ago. Um, I don't think she's here anymore, but um, sleep is critical. Okay, there she is. Sorry, she's behind the, she's behind the camera. Um, sleep is critical, okay? You can't fix bad sleep, meaning that if you have bad sleep, everything that goes on is a challenge. You have to go after sleep first. It's critical. If you can only fix one thing, you know, walk a little bit, change your sugar intake, and really work on your sleep. But how do we do this? Well, we start by measuring. Okay, there's great technologies now, and sleep works in this circadian rhythm. We've heard several people talk about this now. We can measure this. We have tools like aura rings. Who's got an aura ring here? Okay, you see this. Who's got a bio strap? Okay, so we've got bio strap. These are two great technologies that let you start to build awareness of what your sleep processes are. By the way, it also ties in a piece of technology that's called heart rate variability. This is a measurement of your stress response. HRV is kind of like the speedometer on the dashboard of your car, okay? If you have to look at one thing driving, okay, you pay attention to the, to the, to the speedometer. Um, you have little lights that pop on at different times when something's wrong, and a lot of these technologies have little lights that pop on, but looking at that HRV is a really good tool to do, and you should check it not just when the police are watching, but you should check it regularly. If you pay attention to HRV, you stay on the aggregation of marginal gains. If you're not looking at sleep, you're going to be on the aggregation of, 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 of bad stuff. Um, Again, beat to beat HRV, this is a great heart uh, uh, performance wave technology. We got to where with my wrestlers at Ohio State, I could predict their success, I could predict their performance in the national tournament. I could tell you who was going to be an All-American and who wasn't the first day of the tournament before they wrestled a match. Um, this is a powerful technology and it is a great tool looking at fitness and endurance, stress and recovery. I think this is a key technology to integrate into your game. Finally, light. Okay, the same way we have good food and bad food, the same way that we have good movement and bad movement, we can have good light and bad light. Okay, this is really important. We are light, we are beings that evolve to work in the circadian process. This is critical. So managing your light, there are great tools about this. The one is natural. You know what? One of the first things I try to do, now I'm, I live in Ohio right now, so I'm an East Coast guy out here on a West Coast time zone. It's, it's, it's challenging. And again, when you're on airplanes all the time, this can be a real, one of the things I do absolutely, first thing in the morning is I want to get up and I want to see natural sunlight into my eyes so the pineal gland starts the circadian rhythm. In the absence of light, now yesterday I, we had an hour, I went out and got real sunlight on my skin. Right now in Ohio I live above the 40th parallel. You know what? We had a 60 degree day when I left. The data shows that you need full body sunlight exposure for 40 minutes just for the vitamin D process. 
okay? That's, that, that's naked outside for 40 minutes in the light. We don't do that in Ohio right now. I wasn't naked at the pool yesterday either, but I did have shorts on. But I went out and got a, ch I went out and got a chunk of light. I didn't get too much. I don't do, I don't do um, uh, um, sunscreen. I don't do sunscreen. I limit my sun exposure. Okay, if I, feel like, if I feel like I'm going to have to deal sunscreen, listen, if we're at the beach with my family in Florida, I'll sunscreen up so we can spend more time. When it's me and I'm doing a health process, I get out and get out. When melanin is working, your boy feels good, okay? And so that is my indicator there, so light. But you can also use infrared, near-infrared lights. These can be healing tools. Um, we've seen this happen in our family. When you start to look at managing light, those are what I call the four big rocks in the jar, all of which are mitochondrial driven, okay? All of which are drilling in there, mitochondria, and we start to get that. But let's talk about the jar. The jar is your purpose, okay? There is a lot of pressure from the environment, it's hard to make these decisions. You know what? When you walk through CVS, the gummy bears look damn good. And when you try them, they taste good, okay? But you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason to say, I'm going to pass on that. I'm going to modify my aquarium, and I'm going to move forward with this. Having your purpose. My wife and I were moving into our third third. I've, I've coached great athletes, Olympic medalists, national champions. I've worked with amazing people. Best coaching experience I ever had was my daughter's eighth grade field hockey team. I loved it. I can't wait to coach my grandchildren. Man, I get always, this always gets me. Um, I can't wait to coach. I want to be that crazy grandfather. I had a chance three years ago to go wrestle with my nephew. He qualified for the state, uh, Florida State High School Tournament. He was a heavyweight. We're, you know, he's a big kid. He's playing Division I college football now. I got to go wrestle with him. Did pretty good the first day. I still got some, I still got some stuff back from the 80s. Second day was a disaster. First day was good. So I have no resiliency anymore, but I can still go for a day. Um, that applies to a lot of things in life, doesn't it? Um, but having that purpose, knowing what you want to do. I want to be that crazy grandfather. Okay, that's where I want to be. Oops. If you don't have a purpose, start to develop one. Stephen Kotler is a friend of mine. I love this book. I've recommended it many times. They do a great job of going and figuring out who you are, what you want to do, where your future is going to be. Love Stephen's book. If you're a biohacker and you haven't read Stealing Fire yet, uh, get it. It's a great biohacking book. It, anything that's flow related. This is Stephen's thing, uh, The Rise of Superman. Again, he, he's a great author. I love the work he does. So the question I have to you, how are you re-engineering your aquarium? So this is how we do it in my life. This is an example. This is my rec room in my house for the last 25 years. Um, we bought this house when my daughter was born. The house we had before that, we had the front. It was a turn-of-the-century home in, in, in a historic room, and I had weight equipment and strength equipment in, in the front room. Okay, so it, it's been important to us. I think I'll put strength equipment in a room rather than a dining, rather than a dining set that I use twice a year. I'll put strength equipment in. Okay, so we just sold this house. Literally, we closed Monday, we're moving. This is my next house. Oh, this is my office. Put a sauna in there, so I've got a sauna in my office. This is our next house. So we're going on the road. We're gonna go figure out where we wanna live next. The house we bought, the decision was based, can I put a sauna in it? So it's got a room that I'm taking bunks out and putting a sauna in our, in our room. We're taking the dinette out where, where the Peloton will go. I've got a strength system with kettlebells and so forth that we've got engineered in. We're engineering our environment, okay? It's a conscious, mindful step forward. So to recap, we live in aquariums. We can't, we can't avoid that, okay? It's, it's, it's the way it is. We have temperature systems that don't let us get too hot, don't let us get too cold. We need to get hot, we need to get cold. Um, autophagy is a key element. This is one of the key the key critical for compressing morbidity and enabling good life into your 90s and 100s. If you don't get through there, you can't get to 120 and 150. Treat longevity like an investment. If you have a 401k, you should start investing in longevity. It's a key point that goes with that. There are key practices and molecules that are necessary for autophagy. You have to move. 
Movement is critical. Um, if you can't move regularly, if, 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 let's, if you can't go pick apples every day, then you've got to, you've got to hack your exercise. Um, Nutrient-dense food, unprocessed is a big step. Fix your sleep. Get on top of this. It's critical. Use light as a weapon. Okay, it's I, I kind of wanted to put like a Luke Skywalker thing in here, but um, but use light as a weapon. It is a key point that affects everything above that. Fix your f and then find your purpose. As spermidine levels drop, autophagy drops. As you increase spermidine levels, uh, it increases autophagy, increases life. And thank you for your time. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Julia? Do I have time for questions? Any questions? We may not need it. Thank you again. Oh, wait, wait, I want to hear one. I do a sauna every day I can. Um, some days I miss it. Now, and again, I'm a little spoiled. I've got a hot, we have a hot tub at the house too. Um, so a lot of times I'll do my heat therapy in the hot tub rather than the sauna. But um, I sauna every time I get a chance. Is that uh, infrared or? No, my, my sauna at home is finished. It's, um, I bake at about 200 degrees. So I go in about 185 and I'm in for uh, 30 to 45. Remember, I'm an old wrestler. We used to wear plastics on a bike in a song. Um, you know, so heat is good. I'm transitioning to infrared in the motorhome, so that's going to be an interesting transition. I just, I'm not putting a finish. I'm not doing 200 degrees in the motorhome. One more? Yeah, like, what if your purpose is your high-level athlete, and then you're, like, in that four zone, right? That's okay to be in there? You, you go into the four zone automatically, okay? When you're competing as an athlete, when you're wrestling in practice, doing any technical, tactical stuff, you go zone four. That's part of the game. You don't need to feed zone four with homework. Do your homework, do the extra work in zone three, okay? So again, you do all your technical, tactical stuff with your coach. You'll get zone four and my five with that. Uh, do the zone three stuff to build the base. So. Too. Okay, you've got to learn to live there. You know, we used to do it. We had a we had a wrestling thing we did, where um, I got a new training partner every two minutes for 60 minutes. We wrestled for an hour, had a fresh guy every two minutes. They rotated three guys. By the end of that, I was completely defensive. Okay, I had no offense left. But you have to learn to live in that space. We call it the dark place. Um, when you get to the dark place and you know you're there and you kind of grin, okay, then you be, get a competitive advantage. Um, so you do that technically, tactically, don't do that with the adapted work. Thank you.